Hello and welcome to The Hunters, AD 2114, by Matus Albrecht. And uh, Matus is a uh, designer we have covered several times on this channel. Um, he uh, is the designer of the game The Convicted and also The Exiled Siege. The Convicted, of course, being one that I have done multiple playthroughs. It is actually... One of my favorites, and what really got me tuned into Matus and his work. And he has um, matured a lot, I think, since then. Um, the Exiled Siege, I didn't care for as much as The Convicted, but he took it in a whole new direction um, and really addressed a lot of the criticisms of Convicted. And, um, and then, of course, uh, uh, made it into a different game, which is what it should have been. Um, it's just that I really liked Convicted convicted the way it was. So I wasn't really a person who had a lot of um, issues with it. Now, this game, um, I missed the first Kickstarter, the first edition of the game. This was a very ambitious project for him. And um, uh, it was one of my regrets. And now I am in on the second edition. So I am one of those people who's just now receiving the second edition. I never played the first. I'm very familiar with you know, like One Stop Co-op Shop doing a little bit of the first edition, you know, some things like that. Um, but uh, anyways, uh, let's get into it. Uh, there are other people who have covered this game, so I want to express that. Um, I did notice some errors in them, and that's coming from me. That's a crazy thing because I usually make mistakes all the time, and I probably will still make mistakes. It's just that I caught a few of the other ones. Um, so I'm hoping to correct those with this playthrough. And you can see I got the rule book in front of me here. <clears throat> um, the, uh, the rule book is fine. It's a little, it's not as good as a reference guide, meaning that like if I have to look something up, I sometimes have to flip through multiple pages before I find the section that has exactly what I'm looking for. Um, but it seems to be decent. Um, it's got the Matus flair. Like after reading the convicted rule book and then reading this, I can see some of the similarities. And um, uh, he's definitely uh, improved on the older rule books. Um, I, it's really interesting. I've seen comments that people think that this rule book sucks. Um, there's this other game I have, 303 Squadron. If you want a rule book that sucks, um, look no further. Uh, I haven't covered that game yet because I, I'm not confident that I understand the rules. Um, anyways, that's neither here nor there. So what's this game about? Well, this is game is, it's really a dungeon romp kind of game in a post-apocalyptic future with uh, mechanical things. Um, there's a lot of flavor in this game. I'm not a big fan of reading flavor text, uh, but this game, I think in order to enjoy it, you must read the flavor text. So, um, I will do my best. I'm, I am definitely one of those people who likes to just skip the flavor text and get to the choose your own adventure part. And so let's talk about that. This game has some choose your own adventure. It required, it reminds me a little bit of, um, seventh continent in a way, um, in the way that the exploration and stuff works, but that's where it ends. Like seventh continent is like a giant game of memory where you play it until you die then everything resets and then you play it again and then get maybe a little bit further and then you die and then you reset it. And so you're constantly replaying the same thing over and over again until you you get it right. This game possibly could have that. I, I just don't know yet. But it has a lot of the decision cards and things like that um, that uh, are necessary for... Um, it's more than just a, a combat... Uh, it's not Descent Journeys in the Dark. It's got a little bit of that to it. It's like a, a mix between that and Seventh Continent and um, really just like a choose-your-own-adventure RPG type thing. I'm not sure I'm going to like it, to be quite honest. I, I think it's a little too heavy on the choose-your-own-adventure uh, for me. But, uh, but with that being said, it, it does look fun. And I am... I'm definitely interested. And one of the things that I noticed when I looked at the videos of other people covering this game is none of them finished. And, and of course, that's a bold statement because I've started a lot of campaigns and not finished them. 
largely because, you know, I got bored myself with uh, the campaign. And um, let's be honest, in the YouTube world, um, whether it's One Stop Co-op Shop and all of his millions of viewers, or myself with my 65 viewers, um, the most views are in the first couple videos, and then it tapers off drastically. And, you know, by video number 30, which I am very uh, common to get to, I may only have three people that have made it that, that will ever watch that far. But the those of you who watch my channel or join me at the table, you know that uh, I still go to video 30 anyways, <laughs> most of the time. I mean, there are a few times I have quit, but... Uh, Anyways, I, I'm going to try to, let's do a campaign. I mean, that's the whole point of this, right? Now, there's two campaigns. I have the, the base campaign that comes with the game. And then I have this, it's upside down, but please forgive me. I have this hybrids expansion, which comes with another uh, campaign. And I think that was part of the Kickstarter, is I got in on the second, you know, Kickstarter, which was I think selling this new expansion, the hybrids. Um, whereas for me, I haven't even played the base game yet. So um, <clears throat> the hybrids is not mixed into this. I think there's some elements of it that I can mix in, but the 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 math required to figure out what to mix in and what not to mix in was just not worth it. Um, I did mix in two uh, other expansions, which are I apologize, I'm reaching across the table. Uh, New Huntsville. And then the other one is called Ship Town, which is a small box, just the same size. So we do have those mixed into this. And um, all right, so if you're not familiar with the uh, format of, of my, my videos or the style, uh, this is going to be the setup video, and then the playthrough will be the next one. So I apologize on what... Uh, seven minutes in before I finally told you that. So if you're here for the playthrough, just look for the next video in this playthrough series. Um, I try to at least name the core the same, and then um, uh, I put them in a playlist, so you can, once you find that playlist, you can you can just go from one video to the next to the next. Um, so the next video will be the, uh, the playthrough will actually start. This is gonna talk about the components and the setup, which there are a lot of. And so uh, let me get started with that. Okay, so first thing that you're gonna run into is there is um, <clears throat> a lot of components like this. And um, you know, you're gonna punch those and then of course sort them. The, the red, uh, let's, let's talk about a player board. Uh, so for example, in this game, we have the soldier in the game. And you can see that the, uh, the way it works is they have some basic attributes here on the left. Um, they start with some starting equipment that you'll notice here. And then they have um, blue, which are like equipment um, sacks. So the uh, the number six here means it can carry six modules. So um, you can fill it up like it's a, an empty backpack, or you can actually put an item that uh, would, you know, take up that, consume that whole thing. So for example, I'm gonna grab something off camera here. There's this flare. And so the flare allows everybody to ignore nighttime rules. And you can see it's got the little blue symbol. Well, that flare would take up the entire backpack slot, like so. Um, and then they would have room for six modules. Or if you don't have this, you can carry 12 modules. Now, what's a module? A module is um, uh, one of these. They're really just... Uh, components that are building blocks for building something bigger. So, for example, you can take three junk modules, put them together, and you can build a, a room with it. I mean, I'm not kidding. I mean, you really build a room with three junk modules. And so, uh, you know, there'll be computer chips and things like that, and you, you collect a certain number of modules, and it lets you construct. So there's a lot of crafting in this game. Okay, so so it's uh, you're either carrying a blue item or six modules for each spot. So this would be 12 modules uh, here. This is an armor uh, slot. And then these are, um, uh, they're like clothing, I think is what they called them. Um, they're, um, 
I mean, for all intents and purposes, they're light brown. <laughs> so they're it's their own special kind of item. And so I'm looking off camera here, and for example, we have this, uh, there's an exoskeleton that looks like it would fit the bill. And then there's uh, night vision devices uh, like this that would also, and, and they do a real good job of color coding. So for example, um, you can notice that that's brown and then this is green, etc. cetera. So um, the game does a real good job of color coding. So that way you know, okay, it's the brown one that goes in the brown slot. I mean, it's not a rocket science thing. And so then you can see the red item goes into the red slots. And of course the soldier class has room for uh, items that go all the way across. This particular machete takes two of the slots and that is, you know, intentional. And so I only have room for two more. And then um, I have four, um, they look like uh, magazines, you know, but they're, they're really just accessories. And those accessories could be for ranged equipment or for uh, even like uh, this machete, like you can possibly put weights or whatever on here to make it, you know, more balanced or or whatever. There's things you can put on, and they're, and they're all green, and, and just so, um, so this is a weird one, but I can attach a knife to the machete. I know that's, oh no, I'm sorry, the knife is red. I, I apologize. I'm looking for green. Mm. Oh yeah, here we go. So now I'm making it a serrated blade, and so that would get attached, like so. And they use, they got the duct tape. I don't, all the melee stuff has duct tape on it. Um, so uh, that's the gist. And, and there are five characters provided in the game. The campaign allows up to four. If you do less than four, there's always special rules in each mission, or there could be. Um, I really think the game is balanced for four. Uh, so if you start doing less than four, you're, um, you're you know... You're testing the balance, if you will. Uh, but each mission does have the adjustments that you need to do so to balance it for less than four. And if you're going to truly solo this, you still must have a minimum of two characters, according to the rules. You must solo at least two characters. Um, is four characters going to be too much? I think in some ways yes, and in some ways no. Like, I'm really excited of the idea of doing four characters, um, which is what I am going to do. Uh, but every character comes with a deck of cards, and these deck of cards are their action cards. And um, there are 25 level 1 cards that will go with each character, and then eventually it goes to level 2, which of course don't unlock until the character levels up, excuse me, to level 2. So this is going to be like their action deck. And so um, when you're in a mission, you get to pick cards to start the mission with, but then after that, they're shuffled and you have to draw. So if there's a particular card in here you wanted, you're gonna have to hope you draw it, or you're gonna have to make sure it's one of the original ones that you start the, the mission with, which um, you know is a neat idea to be able to start the mission with the exact cards you want. Um, but yeah, you're gonna be basically playing every mission with a deck of 25 cards. When you level up, you're gonna unlock new cards, which um, then become a part of your overall deck uh, however, every time you start a mission, you must pick 25, so if you want all of your new level 2 cards to be a part of the next mission, you got to take some level 1 cards and remove them. Uh, that, that's the, the way this, this works. Uh, okay, um, so uh, getting into the rest of the uh, components, I'm going to show you here real quick. There are these little modules that I've been showing you. I've been pulling them, you know, so there's some of the brown ones. Those white ones up in the top left are the armor. You can see all the blue. A lot of them are mines, like traps that you can plant, first aid kits, things of that nature. Then you can see the red, which are weapons, and then the green, which are the attachments. So there's quite a lot to choose from. And that's not counting what I have in this box. Like in this box are some of the bigger items which are mostly weapons um, that uh, you can unlock later in the game. Okay, so uh, I talked about how every character has their own uh, deck. So the deck will look like this. So you'll see like that's a dog tag picture. And then um, this is a little sniper picture. And uh, so their deck of cards 
are like this, and then it just matches the top left of their, their board. The boards are double-sided. The information is exactly the same, except it's male and female, so you get to pick. So I picked a male soldier, a female sniper. Um, and then I, over here, I picked a uh, recon and a huntress. And the one character I didn't pick was the medic, which I usually always pick the medic in games. Um, even when I used to play Fallout back in the day on the computer, I was always the intelligent computer geek medic guy who can heal everybody else and hack into a computer. I always had that type of character um, in my games. In this one, I'm choosing not to do the medic and it could be a very poor choice. I, I don't know. Um, I have to take somebody out and I don't know who. <laughs> like, I feel like I must have the sniper. I must have the soldier. The uh, recon and the huntress are the ones that are up for grabs. And uh, I think if there's anybody that I would swap out, it would be the huntress. But the huntress has all these trap abilities and these bonuses with traps. And so I'm going to try it. Um, it just sounds like it's more fun. Also, this particular game, I think healing is important, but uh, killing is the name of the game. And the medic doesn't strike me as a killing machine. And so I just feel like I'm going to be stuck running around healing people, compensating for the fact that I have one less character in the game uh, doing the killing. And I could be dead wrong on that. It's just that's sort of what vibe I get. And so that's why I picked the character that I did. Okay, uh, continuing on, um, there's some, obviously some dice that are going to be used. Uh, these are attack and defense dice. Um, I had already mentioned that there's going to be a whole pool of these with different symbols. Those are your modules. Um, you're going to need stuff like this, which are going to be for the story uh, objectives. Uh, we have, this is food. And then that there is um, money in the form of uh, uh, fuel credits. Um, so uh, fuel is, uh, is king in this, uh, in this game. Uh, they give you some of these, which are uh, basically just multipliers. So if you run out of components, you can always use this to sh represent that that's five or 10. Uh, this uh, is for every character uh, to, to denote whether or not they're um, they're hidden on the map, so you can just put one on on, on the characters. Uh, they give you five of them. I guess uh, the medic is one of these. I don't know which one. And that's the medic symbol, so there's going to be... That's left behind, of course, because I didn't choose the medic. Um, these are damage tokens for denoting damage on monsters. These are going to be used for keeping track of things in the game. They're really just time to denote time-specific events. Same with this. These are your experience points, which I might be using poker chips for. And uh, that is morale tokens, which we will definitely be using in this game. Okay, so going over, that was some of the basic uh, components in the game. Then we have a big pool of cards that have this little timer on them. These are what's called blueprints. So uh, basically in the game, there's going to be, uh, you have a base. Let's talk about that real quick. So we have this base here. And I have it further up on my table because I want room for me to have the rule book in front of me. This is where all the battles are going to occur. So, um, so it's a little... A uh, little out of reach for me, but not too bad. This particular uh, base has various rooms in it. And, and for example, this is for craft. They're all for crafting. So this is for crafting ranged weapons and stuff like that. It also has, um, that's a calendar, if you will. We are on uh, turn or day number one. And you can see it goes all the way up to 28 days. And then what happens is the counter flips over and... Um, Basically, the campaign lasts 58 days. If we ever get to um, that 28 spot, uh, after uh, going through it again, I'm sorry, it looks like it goes up to 30. It looks like it goes up to 30. 
Um, but that 28 marker is is the, the key marker. If we get to that the, the second time around, then um, the game ends. And I'm, or I'm sorry, no, 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 it's the 26. It's the red, what you see in red. Uh, I apologize. The 26 is the big milestone. So we're going to progress one day at a time. And we're basically going 56 days. The, uh, what you see here is 30 days, and then the marker flips over and has a 30 written on it. And so then you just keep going until you get to 56. Okay, then uh, over on the right there, uh, this is just for whenever you're in a mission, you may have like only five turns to complete a mission. And so that's just a little timer. And we have uh, markers on the top right there. Uh, that's for each uh, character class, so you can track who has taken their turn and who hasn't, you know, things of that. The base itself is really just a place for crafting and resting, and uh, and then of course you can store things, um, etc. So the base is um, something you can upgrade and build. It's very much like Convicted. If you've watched that playthrough series, in the Convicted you're building your castle and you have to level up your or upgrade your barracks and you know things like that. This is no different. Um, and there's a uh, there's buildings for everything. In this, uh, so for example, this would be the uh, the craft station, and you can see I need three junk modules to be able to build a level one uh, workshop, and then three more junk modules to get to level two, and then three more to get to level three. And then you can see uh, that takes three days to finish, five days to finish, eight days. So there's even a number of days it takes before you can even uh, access it. And then once you do, uh, it flips over and you have you could build uh, various uh, items uh, inside the, uh, the room. Okay. So with that being said, uh, we have blueprints, which is what I was talking about. Uh, the blueprints uh, can be built based on the rooms that you have available. So for example, this antidote here costs one junk module and um, Basically, you can build an antidote, and it requires uh, a lab level one. That's what this means. That's the lab, uh, which is one of these rooms, right up there at the top. So uh, you need to own a blueprint to be able to build items in your base. Even though you have the room, if you don't have the blueprint, you can't make the item. So that's one of the key things. And you can see here, there's tons and tons of items in this game. So how I'm going to acquire all these blueprints and, you know, whatnot, that's part of the mystery of playing this, which I've never played. So I can't tell you, like, what a good strategy is versus isn't. Um, but that's part of this game, is we're going to be unlocking these blueprints. And uh, it keeps going. In fact, yeah, so that's just another one. It's a sound generator. Here... These are what's called imp implants. So uh, each character has an implant and they can get, um, so for example, this implant here will let them have, um, you know, basically you're gonna be like Wolverine. You'll have, uh, you know, blades, you know, inserted into your body or it looks like attached to your body. <laughs> and then um, basically it's just gonna be a, a permanent weapon attached to you. And there's also, you know, I guess knee bone shafts, which will, you know, give you extra health. Uh, this one will modify your persuasion ability, you know, etc. So this is actually, uh, you got a pocket underneath your skin. So you have a space for four more items um, or any uh, blue item, really. And there's one that, you know, you got subdermal armor. So you can put armor underneath your skin, etc., etc. So these are implants that you can get uh, for your characters as well. And um, those also, I think, um, require the lab, et cetera, to, to put it. Now, how do I know if I can do implants? When we were looking at the player board, for example, the soldier has room for two implants. And I know that because right here, that's what this is. This is an implant of two. This is their morale of one. Their persuasion is zero and their strength is two. And strength is mostly hand-to-hand -hand combat prowess. And you can see here that the sniper has room for two implants as well, and so forth. Um, the uh, I'm realizing I forgot something for the soldier, and I'm just looking for it. It's called the goggles. 
And the soldier actually starts with goggles, so I'm going to put that on his board. Okay, so uh, as far as the rest of this goes, um, in the beginning of the rule book, it explains from setup. First off, it's got a nice graphical image of what all the components are. That is very, very helpful. The next thing that um, you need to do is your character setup. So you choose your characters, and I'm going to uh, mess with my camera a little bit here. So we're gonna choose our characters, and everybody chooses their character and grabs a miniature. Um, I had a hard time figuring out which miniature goes with which, and maybe other people have an easier time than me on this, but it just seemed like really hard. Uh, but I, I just pick, pick something that looks close enough and I'm good with it. Each player chooses their starting gear, and um, you really don't get to choose your starting gear. It tells you. You just have to go find it. Um, and then it's considered to be in inventory, so you can trade or sell it or whatever from the start of the game. I don't recommend you do that, but it is an option. Uh, then um, you have to take the turn token, which is the uh, little tokens that I was explaining in the top right. Um, you put your health token and your level token on the one space of the health track. And I did notice that this is different than the uh, first edition of the game, and uh, this edition is much cooler than the first edition of the game. Uh, each player, and, and let me show that real quick. So you can see here that's level one. And so your health token goes there, and then this goes around it. And what it's doing, in a nutshell, is it's denoting that you're experience level one, okay? And that you need 20 experience points to get to the next experience level. That's the first thing. It's also denoting your cap. So as you lose health, it's gonna go this way. And then as you gain health, this is the maximum you can gain. You can't go to the right any further. So it's acting like a barrier. And then if I ever were to level up and get the 20 experience points, this would move over to the 20. And then now I can move my health up even more. I mean, it's, it's a really simple thing, but that's what they're referring to. Uh, you grab your morale tokens. So for example, you start the game with one morale token and, and of course the three food that's listed here. Every day that goes by, your soldiers consume one food. I don't think there's any exceptions. And it's one food each. Um, and if they can't consume food, then um, they lose a health. Now, uh, I think food is a pooled resource. So if one soldier has two food and another soldier has zero, you can always share. I don't think there's any issues in that regard. The rules um, seem to indicate that that's okay. Uh, this is probably where it could have been a little nicer because like if I were to tell you where in the rule book did I see that, I would have a hard time finding it. Um, I'm pretty sure I read that somewhere. Um, and then you can also see here that, you know, food is actually a pulled resource. It's not on your character board because um, uh, the fuel credits is also a pulled resource. The only thing that I would say is not pulled resource is the um, experience points and the morale. So that's the part that's weird. I don't think each character has its own individual money, which is what this seems to indicate. Um, and that's something that uh, uh, the rule book could have done better with explaining. So, um, like I said, each character starts their action cards comprised of all cards with a one. And um, if you counted up all the cards with a one, there's exactly 25. So you don't have to do any rocket science in the beginning of the game. You basically start with your full deck that's available to you. It's only when you start leveling up that you have to start doing some card play and figuring out which cards you want in your deck and which cards you don't. And you can look at the mission and as part of the preparation for the mission, you can change that. So whatever decisions you make there are not permanent. Although when you level up, um, there's like seven new cards that become available, but you only pick like three or four of them. And that is permanent. Like whatever ones you don't pick are permanently out of the game. So that is a drastic choice, and I'm going to be very stressed out, of course, whenever I get to that point. Um, but yes, uh, that is character setup. So then the rest becomes your campaign setup. And the campaign setup is interesting. You have to use the mission playbook 
for part of it. And then, of course, uh, the cards. So let's continue talking about the cards. The first thing is you have a lot of cards that have this symbol in them and then a number. These are your choose-your-own-adventure cards. Or if you've ever played Seventh Continent, they're your, you know, your location cards. This is all like this smokehouse is going to – this is an event. that I think they call them event cards. So when they say, you know, do event 213, that's what they're referring to. And I really love the fact that it's written here and also there. He did a really good job in that regard. Now, um, one thing I, I realized before I started recording but I didn't actually do yet is they do give you these dividers, which you can see I haven't even unpackaged yet. Um, these dividers will allow me to put the cards in the various... Um, uh, number. So I don't need to have them. Right now I got them sitting in just massive piles. Um, so I can start to like sort them based on their little dividers here and that'll be a little bit helpful. I, I will do that. Um, I just haven't done it yet. And so um, they also give you uh, these boxes. Um, the whole intention is is you put them in the box and then that divider will stay in the box and, and your cards will be, you know, along that. And as you can see, I haven't been using the boxes for that purpose up to this point, but that is the goal or the role of the boxes. Uh, I probably will start using them for what they're designed for, but they've been so helpful in the ways I've been using them so far. Okay, next. You have what's called city event cards or city cards, and they're going to have this little green symbology along the top. Um, and then this is just a cover card. So what you do is you're just going to shuffle these, and you shuffle all of them, and they're supposed to be, um, like, see here it says one of two. Like, I did a really poor job here of, um, I got some of them mixed up. So, for example, these, are they all say two of two. Right? They're supposed to be on their one of two side. So uh, it's no big deal. When you draw the card, you just flip it to the correct side. But, but basically, they're double-sided. Uh, they're like a lot like a choose-your-own-adventure. You read the front, and then you read the back, and then you, um, you, know, you do what it says. Um, this, of course, just goes on top. And I don't know why it's zoomed in so much. Uh, my apologies. But uh, this goes uh, just on top after you shuffle them. Now, uh, those expansions, the, uh, the, um, the ship town and, uh, oh gosh, whatever, the new hunt. Hey there, welcome back. I uh, received a phone call while I was recording. So just making sure the video is working again. Okay, so anyways, long story short, these are like city events. Um, so you basically, you shuffle them, you put this on top, and then it forms a pile. Now, what I was getting at is that the expansions, those little small box expansions, have a bunch of extra cards that end up in here. So if you want to mix in those small box expansions, you can do so, and uh, it'll cause these to... This pile uh, gets a little bit thicker. Uh, because of it and I'm realizing I want my camera up a little bit higher so my apologies there as I fix that okay so what it's showing is the baseboard which we went over and then it's basically explaining that you need your story cards in those little boxes and then you're gonna have what's called a road card pile and there's a level one level two level three danger and then it shows down here like a virtual board that that the locations in the game is you have your base which is like level zero and then zone one is going to be like the easiest encounters and then zone two is going to be two levels of difficulty and then zone three up here and then you're going to have locations in each of those zones so what I did was, is I set them up um, slightly different than the rule book shows, because you can see here they're showing the one, two, and three along the top with the, uh, the city encounters that I have up there. What I did is I set it up this way. So here's the zone one uh, road cards, 
And by the way, it, they're the same way. They're double-sided, so you just shuffle them. And then you have this little cover card that just goes over top. And, and then um, you're going to set up your locations. And this is, of course, the, the threat one locations. And then that's threat two and those locations. And then there's threat three all the way up at the top and those locations. Now, um, I'm going to start with the threat three and uh, we'll go backwards. Uh, the, the threat three is when you take these new expansions, you can see that they have um, in a setup section, they're telling you to set up 460 and 461 in zone three. So this is the, uh, the ship town uh, expansion. So if you have the base game, you're gonna start the base game similar to what the rule, <laughs> excuse me. The rule book is gonna show a blank zone three, meaning you haven't discovered anything there yet. But if you play with this expansion, Ship Town will show up in zone three. So it's just, uh, it's gonna be a little different uh, if you have the expansions. And the game does come with a, a poster of all things. Uh, so the poster, I'm just unfolding it here, looks like so. And you can see like um, the new Huntsville is here in the corner. This is new Jensen, which is zone one. Uh, El Infernio is zone two. And then Ship Town over here would be zone three, at least according to the zones. And you can see like how that fits into an overall map, which, um, you know, that map is only th for thematic purposes. We don't really use this, I don't think, um, as part of the gameplay. Uh, but it's a cool addition. Uh, it's just poster. I'm sure it didn't cost too much to print. Um, and it does help to visualize the, the area that, you know, we're talking about. So, um, so what you can see here is, uh, if we go to zone three, you have these cards here that have the little smokestack picture on them. And, um, 460 is just this card right here. So 460 is going to be revealed and that's ship town. And it also shows on the top uh, the threat level. And it's actually a threat level one. I apologize, I thought this was a three. Uh, this is only a threat level one, so this doesn't go up here. This goes down in the bottom. So that's not a zone three threat, it's a zone one threat. So ship town uh, is gonna appear here. And, and the actual town has the little threat level next to it. So then within Shiptown, there is a wreck. So this is a location inside of Shiptown, and then what it has is a little street sign. Uh, that's how you can tell the difference. So this is a location within Shiptown. Uh, so Sh Shiptown itself is a location you visit, and then once you're there, you can go and visit the wreck that's inside of Shiptown. And, and it also has, um, what it tells you to do is to put these cards face up. Now these are, um, the event cards that we were talking about, right? The little choose your own adventure things. They're face up, which means that when we get to this location, we can freely look at them and, and do whatever they say. And you can see like this is a, a level three. So this would be a difficult encounter, whereas this one is not. And so this particular one, um, you know, they're telling you to place 832 face down under 460, and then each character gains some money um so you know we could we could choose to do that and i don't know what 832 is going to be we'd have to go grab it um but if we choose to resolve this event then 832 is going to come out now face down that's another interesting aspect of this game uh cards can be face up on top uh face down on top face up underneath or face down underneath. So when they're face up underneath, um, they're really not supposed to be known yet. So I just sort of cheated and looked at one. Um, the thing is, is if you play this game multiple times, these cards don't change. I mean, this is very much like Seventh Continent in that regard, except there they had seven curses, so or six curses, or however many. Um, so that changed things up a little bit. But once you memorize it, it's memorized. There's nothing you can do about it. Um, but what face up means is that anybody who goes to this location can freely <coughs> look at them, no harm. 
And then you can choose which ones you want to do and in whatever order you want to. Face down um, means that you can still choose to look at them, but when you choose, you're committed. So as soon as it flips over, you're stuck with whatever it says. Whereas now I can read whatever it says and just choose to ignore it and leave it be. Whereas if it's face down, um, I have to resolve whatever it is that I revealed. Okay, that's the difference. Now, um, the fact that it's underneath the card versus on top of the card, that's a good question. Um, let's see, it says put 460, place 820, 831, and 841 face up under 460. Um, so the uh, if these were on top of it, then you can look at them, but even before you get to the location. That's the only thing. So I'm trying to cover them up. That's what I'm doing here is I'm covering them up. And so these are three events that we can look at when we get to that particular location. And then, of course, once we get to that location, this REC 461 is here. And there's nothing really written on it. It's just a REC um, that's there. Now, um, there's other things that are also in uh, the level one. And that's New Jensen. So New Jensen here is, as you can see, it's a level one threat. It also has a event on it, but it's face down. And our marker is we are here. And um, we're actually on that exact location. So that event's going to be revealed because we chose to move there and it's face down. So that's going to reveal and we have to resolve whatever it says. So at the start of the game, when we actually start playing, that's the first thing we're going to do is resolve that event card, 001. Now, New Jensen has locations within it. And you can see... Again, the street signs, and and within those street signs, you can see there's a main square, there's under the side, there's the piggery, and the gun store. And, and you can see there's some shops here that has various goods for sale. And, um, and that's one of the things that we're going to probably be, you know, interacting with throughout the game. And like, for example, under the side here, the first aid kit, I can get the blueprint for that. You can see there's a blueprint for sale. And so um, that's available here at the under the side. And it costs, uh, I believe it costs $4 for that blueprint and or four fuel credits, right? And, um, and then you can also even work to earn credits if you wanted work plus one day per character. So I can earn two fuel credits per character. Um, so those are the, the various things. And then like uh, this here, the main square has different materials for sale. So if I want to buy a module, a junk module, it costs me two fuel credits. And then the red arrow pointing up is to sell them. So I can always sell some extra ones that I have too. So, uh, so I can buy some stuff. I can, like I said, I can get uh, some blueprints so I can make some items. And this is more blueprints. And even more. So that's all right here at New Jensen. And then the other thing that's unlocked is El Inferno, Infierno. Uh, that's at a level two. Um, so it's a level two town. So El Infierno has its own um, locations. And then per the expansion, New Huntsville is a level two area, and it also has some locations and some events that are underneath the card. No different than Shiptown. So um, how do I know all this, and how will you know all this if you're playing your game? Well, that's where you get the mission book. So there's a mission book here, and in the beginning there's a, a giant you know, flavor text. And then here's where it tells me to do that setup that I just did. So 405, 404, et cetera, all these locations are gonna get set up. And that's what you see over here. This uh, new Jensen, um, you know, 405 is the under the side portion of new Jensen, you know? So all those things get unlocked. And then the 001 is face down on top of 404 and our hunter's marker is on 404. So that's us. So. We are the hunters, and uh, we're on 404, 
and this event is face down on 404. So the game is forcing us to trigger that event, and that's how the game is going to start. We're going to resolve that event on this location right there. Now, um, time is going to pass in this game, and as time passes, um, those, that day marker is going to move. Now, when we, um, let's say that we can freely move, but it's not the case right now. We have to resolve this event at the start of the game. But later in the game, we could choose to go back to the base. So that would be a movement back to, you know, the base. And I believe that I have, they have a little chart that explains how that works. But I believe that takes a day to do the movement because I'm going from location to another location. If I even go from New Jensen over to Shiptown, that's a location to location move. If I go from New Jensen to New Huntsville, that's a location to location. It doesn't matter that I'm going to a higher difficulty location. It's still just location to location. And they all seem to be equidistant. Like there's no such thing as, oh, that one's two days to travel to get to that one. They all, they're all one day to get from one to the next. And if I were to travel, um, that's where I have a potential that I'm going to have to draw a road event. And that's what these come in. And the road event I draw is based on which location I'm at. So if I'm moving to New Huntsville, I'm going to draw a uh, harder location or a harder road event card than the, you know, a level two road event card instead of a level one. That's really the gist. Now, when I'm at New Jensen and I want to travel to these spots inside of New Jensen, these are locations in New Jensen, that doesn't take time off the clock. Um, it's still considered travel, and then there's a potential I'm going to draw one of those city events as I go from, you know, one street to another. I would refer to these as streets since they have streets on them. So if I'm, so once I'm in New Jensen and I go to a particular street and then I want to move to this street, you know, that doesn't cause a day to go by on the calendar, but there is a chance I may have to draw a city event and resolve that. So that's the, the it in a nutshell is um, this game is going to be about moving to these various locations, making decisions. I can buy and sell goods. I can always go back to the base. I can build things at the base. I can start getting more equipment. Obviously, this is going to be about uh, getting equipment for our characters, getting money for our characters, um, and so forth. And then, of course, there's this story that's going to develop as we go. Now, some of these storylines, uh, we're supposed to complete the campaign, like I said, within 56 days. I think the biggest risk of me playing this is that I don't know what that means. So, like, if I have a decision where I can wait a day to get some money, you know, like there was that option here to work. So we can work. For every day that we work, we get $2 per character. <coughs> is that worth doing? If I do that, am I ruining my game? How many days can I work before it's I'm starting to threaten myself and, and not win the game? So can I work and get $30 so I can buy the, the best armor in the game? You know, I, that's the stuff I don't understand. So I don't know, like, how many days I can waste doing things like that versus, um, you know, uh, there is a timeline in this and there's a timer um, that I have to work against. But I just don't know how strict it is, how tight it is. That's all the stuff I, I don't fully understand. But um, we'll get into that as we play the game. Anyways, I hope that helps with the setup. The setup is actually, um, it seems a little convoluted at first, and it's a little overwhelming at first, but it's actually very straightforward. Once you break down the components and understand them, and then understand how some of the setup is in the mission book, some of the setup is in the uh, individual expansions, right? Um, and then you understand the concept of these towns and zones. That's really where the, the setup time is taken. And then, of course, deciding which character you're not bringing with you. And in my case, it was the medic. Um, so that's it. It's the Hunters, AD 2114. I have no idea if this is going to be a great game. Uh, it looks fun. It really does. Uh, I'm hoping it's less like Seventh Continent and more like Descent. Um, I'm not a big fan of Seventh Continent. I actually think the game bores me. Um, I love Choose Your Own Adventure books. I grew up with those. I just don't enjoy them as much in a board game. Um, 
but we'll see. We'll see. Uh, I think um, this game has a lot of interesting things to it, and I'm eager to dive in. So let me go ahead and wrap this up. Um, again, I apologize. I got a phone call in the middle of the video, so I hope it didn't distort the video too much. It looks like the sound and everything is working. That happened to me before where the sound just went kaput after uh, I got a phone call. So I hope everything's working okay, and I will see you in the next video, and we will start the playthrough. Thanks for watching, and as always, stay awesome.